All right, good afternoon. My name is Thomas Feature, and this is Real World Math Lessons with Google Earth. Okay, howdy. Can you hear me all right? All right, as we say on the uh, island of Guam, half a day. That's right, I've come here all the way from the island of Guam. I think this year's conference has the largest number of Guamanians present, so you could end up sitting next to somebody from Guam. If you do, make sure you say half a day to them. All right. Uh, Guam is a, is a U.S. territory located all the way across the Pacific Ocean there by the, by the Marianas Trench. Can you see it? Wait. It's, uh, there it is. There it is. It's Guam. It's not, uh, it's not the largest island. Oh, here we go. It's only about 30 miles long and 150,000 people. And the motto of Guam is, Guam is where America's day begins. Uh, the island was uh, occupied by the Japanese during World War II, and right about this time of year is everyone's gearing up for the Liberation Day Carnival and Parade. Uh, can we lower the lights a little bit more, please? Okay. All right. And I've been a teacher there for the last 20 or so years. I teach math uh, primarily. Uh, to all different grade levels. I'm a Google certified teacher and app certified trainer. And um, it's really uh, nice to get off island and to, to come to a conference like this to, to meet people. Uh, maybe some of you I've, I've uh, been communicating with for a long time uh, on the internet. And you know, not just traveling to these conferences, but I'm really grateful for the advances in technology in the past decade that allow me to share things with people all around the world to communicate and collaborate with people. It's, it's, a, it's a huge improvement over what we used to use. <laughs> so it's a, lot, it's a lot easier this way, quicker. So uh, flying here, flying to the mainland from Guam, there's either two routes that we normally take. We either go through Hawaii or else, uh, as I did, I went through Tokyo. And and then from Tokyo, I flew to Minneapolis. And when, you, when you're used to seeing a, like a flat map representation of the world, you'd think the, to fly from, from Tokyo to Minnesota is about the same, maybe a latitude, but so that I would just fly directly east across the ocean. But actually, the route that I took was up near the Arctic Circle. Let me get rid of the grid up near the Arctic Circle, down through Alaska, down through Canada, all the way down to where Minneapolis is. And then from there, it's a pretty straight shot down to San Antonio. So that's the journey that I took to get here to be with you today. Altogether, it's 8,600 miles that I traveled. So there might be some people out there that traveled further than I did to get here, but I'm wondering if there's anyone who traveled faster than I did, because I think I got here pretty fast. If, if you look at my, my flight itinerary, I left, I left Guam on Saturday morning at 10.30, <laughs> and then I got to Minnesota at 2.30 on Saturday. So it just took me four hours to get from Guam to Minnesota. That's pretty good. A couple more, it, was, it took three hours to get from Minnesota to, so it must be, must be more turbulence or something. It took three hours to get from Minnesota to San Antonio. But 8,600 miles, let's see, that would be uh, 1,230 miles per hour is how fast I got here. So I don't know if you, anybody beat that, maybe? If you believe that, either I was traveling at supersonic speeds uh, at uh, Mach 1.6, or else there's a real world math problem here that we can explore. And that's what I would like to talk to you today about, is how Google Earth can be used to explore problems, not just in math, but in science, history, literature, all kinds of things. Google Earth is a very versatile uh, technology application. It's a free application from Google. It's loaded with all kinds of content and tools that you can use in your classroom. You can use it for teacher-centered instruction, uh, student-centered learning. You could do flipped classroom activities with it. There's all, you know, any kind of like learning mode or instruction mode, you can use Google Earth, I think. 
And, and the, one of the nice things, nicest things about Google Earth is not only that there's stuff that you can view on it, but also that you can edit the globe. So for instance, you've seen that I've added place marks and paths and uh, some images and things like that that I've used in this little scenario that I created for you. Um, so I can edit the globe and I can add content to it and save it and share it with other people or with students. And uh, for, this, for this scenario, I would probably use, let's see, I would use the, um, maybe the sunlight tool if I wanted to explain this and to show how the, how the sunlight paths go. Or I might, uh, I would incorporate these uh, time zone layers that I made. And you realize that, I, that I've actually already shared, I don't think I ever asked a question, did I? Did I ever say what the problem was here? So that's the thing. The other thing I like about Google Earth is I can just present a scenario. And I don't have to like define it. In fact, you might be frustrated. Some of the things I do are kind of ambiguous, the lessons and activities. But that's by design. I want to make something that, uh, where you can create how, how you want to use it. And so there's lots of different directions you could go with the scenario that I started off with. I, I gave a little bit elements of history and geography and maybe some science and things like that. If you're going to pursue this about, uh, for, for math, then maybe uh, we would get into uh, the time zones. And, and actually, I, I already gave you the, the solution to the problem. I guess the problem is, uh, why did it take me so, you know, why did it only take me seven hours to get from, from Guam all the way? Or well, how come? Why is it like that? So if I was going to use that, I might use the sunlight tool, and I would probably use the time zone. So, the, so I already gave you the answer when I said Guam is where America's day begins. Right? It's on the other side of the international date line. So when I started on Saturday, you were in yesterday for me. And as I left on my today, and I traveled through tomorrow, <laughs> that was your tomorrow. And then at, you know, as I crossed the date line, your tomorrow became my tomorrow, which is today. <laughs> you see, it's really quite simple. And it's the kind of thing that I like to do uh, in my website, realworldmath.org. Perhaps you've heard of it or used it, I would hope. But realworldmath.org real is a website that I created five years ago. And it's uh, problems like I, like I just went over with you. That sort of thing is what I put on the website. There's 50, 50 plus lessons and activities there for, for primarily for math. But uh, as you'll see as I, as I share some things with you today, that's not just math, it, is, it really goes to all kind of subject areas. And uh, so there's lessons here that can be downloaded by the students. You can send them here. There's videos and tutorials. And then there's a section here for teachers that I want to show you right now, just real quickly. <clears throat> and it's uh, password protected, just the thinnest layer of protection to keep the students away from the, like, the teacher's lounge. And so let me tell you what the password is right now. The password is mango. M-A-N-G-O, Mango, that's the password. So I hope you have time to explore it later. Maybe not while I'm talking, but, but later, later tonight, okay? So let me, let me talk a little bit about how I created the website or why I created the website. And we're gonna go to some pretty spot like this. Um, so when I started when I started building the website, to me it was like when the ed tech was kind of booming, when it was really starting out, you know, five six years ago, and and I was uh, envious, frankly, of all the other subject areas, like really doing stuff with technology, the English teachers, and the, you know, and so I, I would look for things online for math, and I didn't like what I found for math online back then. It's gotten a lot better, but back then I wasn't really happy with the with the math content that I found online. And so I, you know, I wanted to address that. The other thing that I wanted to address was the question that every math teacher gets asked all the time. When are we ever going to use this? What is this good for? Why do we have to learn this? So you, you have to pardon the cliche of the title, real world math, but you know, that fruit was ripe for the picking when I, when I chose it. But uh, I wanted to address that. I wanted to show how math can be applied. The other thing that I wanted to address was the how the math curriculum is a mile wide and an inch deep. 
And if you're a math teacher, you know what I'm talking about. And I, I did not like how I just kind of felt like I was always like driving through the textbook, you know, page after page or problem set after problem set. And, and I enjoyed the times when uh, my students and I could slow down and uh, pursue things in more detail or do projects or look more in depth at, at ideas. And that seemed, you know, more beneficial to them and it was more beneficial to me. I, you know, I, I enjoyed doing that a lot more too. So that was the other thing, was I wanted, to, I wanted students to be able to explore concepts more in depth. And the other thing that uh, I wanted to address with the website was the, um, the standardized approach of math instruction, that math has to be taught a certain way, or math should be learned a certain way, or that you know, students are supposed to learn this at this year, or there's this, this is the way that they're supposed to learn it. So I wanted to address that. To me, there's no, no two trees in the forest are alike. So, whoops, that went wrong. So in building the website, uh, there's uh, three pillars, I guess I'd call my, uh, that I built it on. And to address those things. The first was that it was going to be built on technology, that it was going to incorporate technology and all the attributes that we know that technology brings to any, any sort of content. So they'd be using a technology tool for the math. That was one thing I wanted to do. The other thing I wanted to address was that it was going to be a different style of, of instruction or for learning, a different, differentiated instruction. It's a lot more uh, visual type of instruction when you're in Google Earth, a lot different than, uh, than a pencil on paper going through and uh, going through problem sets. And, and so this visual approach, there's some students that I've had that are just, you know, they're really, really grateful that, they're, that, we, that when they ever do anything in Google Earth, they'd be very happy. They'd come to class early. Like these students that normally be the last one there, they'd be the first ones in class and they'd want to know, are we doing Google Earth today? Right? That is you know, a certain type of students that would normally be last. So I kind of, I think that, you know, the last in the classroom. So I think that kind of says something. On the other hand, though, there are the, the students that, that want to have a pencil in hand and they want to just number crunch through things. And now those students did not quite like it as so much. And I think that's, maybe that's kind of describes how math teachers are too. So maybe that's the way math instruction has been the way it has been for so long. But I, I wanted to do something that would address more learners, uh, a broader uh, range of learning styles. And the, the third pillar that I wanted to build it on was that there would be an active learning experience. Active not only that they would be exploring the globe, that they would be moving through the content, but that they're active in creating meaning for themselves. That, the, that uh, like I said, I'm kind of ambiguous in things. I don't spell out and say, this is how it is, or this is how you do that. Uh, I wanted to make something where the students would, would use what they already learned, maybe their prior knowledge, and then I'd put them in a scenario, and then they'd think, oh, I, I need to use this out of my toolkit. This is what I'm gonna use to solve this problem. Or, or maybe like uh, one student would use one technique and another student would use another technique. I, you know, I want it to be like that. I want it to be active, uh, vibrant kind of learning experience. That's what I'm aiming for, at least. All right, so. Um, whoop, let me turn that one off. Sorry. <laughs> You'll see my whole presentation is in Google Earth today, so I'm kind of multitasking. We'll, we'll learn that how well I can do that. So perhaps those are lofty goals. But uh, you know what I created was what I what uh, you know, for me what I wanted to, to use and, and and it's worked out so far I think pretty good for the five years I said that it's been around I've gotten people of hundreds of thousands of uh, teachers have used the website I don't know how many students uh, I hope a lot uh, I get contacted from people from all around the world that are that are using it or want to learn more information about it so so for me so far the website's been a, been a success. What I'd like to, to go through with you then today are some examples of lessons or content that I have on the, on the website. And we're going to go to, not that one, we're going to go to my home state of Minnesota first to start off. And this is one of the first lessons that, that, I, that I built for the website. And if you're familiar with the SAMR, is that SAMR or SAMR model of technology integration? The lowest form of model of, of technology integration is substitution. So you can see that this is a math problem that's really just been substituted with Google Earth that's been put into it. I don't know if technology really, really adds to this problem or not. 
It's a complex area problem. But you know they're using a technology tool for it. But again, like I said, this is the, one of the first ones that I put in here. And I think that's, that's normal when you, when you first start using technology, that you kind of use what you normally do, and you just put it into technology. It gets better. But I, I wanted to show you this, so because, you know, oh, you know what? That doesn't match up well, does it? Let's see. Here's a trick. Uh, Google has historical imagery saved up. So I can look at satellite views for this area from, uh, <coughs> nope, that's not it. Uh, yeah, that's it. All right, that looks good. All right, so when I created this problem, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex area problem. And the idea is that the students would use uh, the ruler tool in Google Earth. And you can set this to any kind of measurement you want. And then they would measure the length of this uh, you know, uh, complex area and, and calculate the area of that. And then the problem continues uh, to the problem continues to where they would find, they'd convert the area to acres. And then from acres, they would figure out how many bushels of corn could be grown in the field. And then from the bushels of corn, how much money would the farmer expect to make with a good, with a good harvest? All right, so real world uh, application, kind of a simple level and all that. But what I found out, the more that I worked in Google Earth, is that it's not this, uh, not, it's not this view of a problem that's really important or the most meaningful one. The best is when you pull back and you consider the larger implications. You look at the larger scope of a problem or, or how it relates to other things. And that's when you start like, bringing in other things like history and science and, and all that. When you get all these kind of elements for them to explore, that's when things really get interesting. And so if you pull back from this view, you realize like, you know, that, that problem is a problem for that one math teacher or for that one uh, farmer. But there's lots of farmers here. There's lots of corn, I guess, grown in Minnesota. You know, this, uh, what are the larger implications of that? What if there was a drought in this area? What would that mean for the farming? So those are the things that, I, you know, after a while I started developing more from that substitution level of technology integration and I tried to get to more higher level things. And, and when I have the students in Google Earth, I want them to explore. I, you know, I don't want attention, attention deficit disorder, but I want them to look around and explore the environment if they see something here, like what's this? This is okay. That looks like a looks like an airport. That's kind of a small airport. I wonder what that's about. Huh? I want them to look around. If they see like a oh, some small town, you know, just kind of looking through, look through and see what what's life like in a small town. If they see something that tracks their eye, like uh, wait, what's that? Is that a shadow? You see that? What is that? Okay, so we we'll use the other Google tools here, like Photos, and explore this. What could that be? Oh, <laughs> it's a jelly green giant. All right. Well, I wonder what he's doing there. I wonder what it what it means for the jelly green giant if there's a drought. I mean, seriously, like when you think about climate climate change and things like that. And you look at farming and agriculture in the in the in the world. You know what does this what does that kind of mean? So that's a that's a simple level of uh, technology integration. Let me let me show you some other ones here that involve measurement. Uh, this is a larger scale one. This is uh, an activity that I that I built around the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. That's kind of a cheery topic, huh? <laughs> well, you know, real world math. So the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, and you can see that I've added elements to Google Earth. And uh, right here I've marked, somebody go next door and tell them the. <laughs> so you see I, I've marked some elements uh, on Google Earth here. Here's the earthquake epicenter. It was a 9.2 earthquake. It was a 13 meter uh, fault slip for almost 1,000 miles long. It generated these huge tsunami waves. And then what I've done here is I've marked some areas around, and here's one on the far side of Sri Lanka. And I, I put everything in universal time. They had a, about 11 meter wave height that swept in and derailed this, this train, and 1,500 people were, were perished. Okay, so I have that data. We know when it got there, we know when the, the earthquake happened. And so using that ruler tool that I showed you before, and we could do it in miles or kilometers or whatever, but uh, I can mark a distance from where the, where the earthquake happened, and to there, and I can see the distance. So now I know the time, and I know the distance, so then I could figure out the, 
the rate, how fast the waves travel. Does that sound interesting, like an interesting use of math? And, and, as they look, and as they go through these different uh, place marks, what they'll start to see is like, here's a spot in Thailand, and the waves came almost at the same time as Sri Lanka. And it's a 13, 13 meter wave, it's a little bit higher even. And so they're going to see that the waves traveled about the same. This is a, a distance of about 900, and this one, 350. They arrived at the same time. So then they start to make some uh, assumptions here, or deductions, like, well, I mean, obviously if they took the same time, this is a shorter distance, the waves must have been going much slower in this direction, much faster in this direction. What does that mean? Well, now we've gone from math to science and exploring a, a science uh, topic. And you can see how Google Earth might give you a, a, some clues of why that is, nice indication. But you know, just in this, this scenario here for this problem, there's so many different ways you can go off into it for science or for math or for cultures, history, all kinds of things. If we pull back, you see there's a whole bunch of place marks that I've had. I've got marked. They'll see that this impacted all around the Indian Ocean, even over here in South Africa. It was measured. I think there's one in, uh, yeah, even down here in uh, Antarctica. In Antarctica from that tsunami, they, they, they uh, registered a one, almost a one meter uh, wave uh, displacement. So they just see like kind of the scope and the magnitude. That's what's interesting, I think. In the end of this, then I might, uh, I might use this tsunami, this uh, wave overlay. See what you can do with Google Earth, isn't that nice? So you know, then you could use this to, as an instructional aid to kind of explain it more with the students. Did you create that online? No, it's, a, it's an overlay that I found online. And then you can import it into Google Earth, and then I wrapped it. And I've made it. I've made it semi-transparent. Can you see the? Can you see the underneath it? You can see through it, right? So I made it semi-transparent, and then I just stretched it and wrapped it until I tried to get it match as well as I could. But that's available on the on the on my website. Okay. So there's uh, real world math, huh? <laughs> okay. Let's do something a little more personal for students. I think I think math should be used to for students to understand their world, right? So one of the, another activity that uses the ruler tool has them marking a path uh, in their town, maybe from a familiar landmark like their, like their school. And they would mark to another familiar landmark one mile. And it's a little easier than, may, than maybe doing like a, a field trip to, or walking a mile to like see, but, but to have them connect, to make a connection, like how long is one mile when they can go on Google Earth and they can see like landmarks they know. They know how far away their school is from where they live or something. Or they can see in Google Earth and compare a mile and a kilometer. You know, I think it's, I think it's reinforced better when, when you have this uh, visual reinforcement. Or even, like I said, you don't want to do a field trip for 100 miles, right? You know, to try to find some landmarks. So these are some things, and, this, the, and the students would do this. The students would mark that path, they'd label it, and every student would come up with a, you know, a different kind of thing of you know, where, where these landmarks are. So that's, how the, that's a couple of ways that the, that the ruler tool could be used. Okay, I'm going to move on to some other examples of uh, what I call uh, concept lessons. And uh, for the concept lessons, it, it, it's more primarily like targets a specific concept. And so for this one, this is, um, uh, what do they call this? Uh, it's money, money exchange problem or exchange rates. Money makes the world go around, I think is, that's the name of it. So here they are in um, Bali. Take them around the world and have them do these problems. So it's an exchange rate problem. They're in Bali at the Monkey Forest. And they have to do an exchange rate for rupees into uh, US dollars. And I give them an exchange rate. So it's kind of a simple proportion problem for them to do. But at the same time, I've just took them to Bali. <laughs> Have you ever been to Bali? Bali is a beautiful place. Like, I'm just I'm I'm inviting them to explore it. The monkey forest. What's the monkey forest like? To have them zoom in and try to like find some monkeys or something. I'm trying to I'm trying to connect not just math, but connect them to to the world. Take them to to New Zealand. Take them to New Zealand, and uh, they can see the the glowworm caves at uh, Watomo. Doesn't that sound interesting, the glowworm caves? What's that all about? 
you know. So there's a math problem here. Exchange rate, you know, they're doing tuition, they're doing uh, tu uh, uh, entrance fee for going into the glowworm caves. They learn that New Zealand has dollars too. Who knew that? New Zealand has dollars, but they're different than our dollars. But then they're going into the glowworm cave. So they did, I might put some uh, content around here. I ask them some questions. Have them go online to find out about the glowworm caves. You know, what's that all about? What's that mean? Take them to Tokyo. Take them to Tokyo, and they'll find out that if they end up in Tokyo some year, that there's actually uh, Denny's in Tokyo. <laughs> the, menu, the menu is a little bit different. And they're going to have to pay in, in yen, but there's a Demi's in Tokyo. OK, so there's exchange rate problem for that. But again, what's, what do I want them to do? I want them to explore. I want them to pull back. And I want them to look around. And I want them to see that, that Tokyo is, is you know, a large city of the world, a major city. You're going to see the buildings keep popping up here as Google Earth loads. You know, this is the three. This is the three D building layer in Google Earth. So, you know, these are the things. It's a, it's a, you know, the math problem is, uh, you know, what you normally would have. But I'm trying to add other elements to it where they're exploring. Here's a, a concept problem that I have on, on uh, finding uh, the area of a complex shape, or an irregular, an irregular polygon. We'll, we'll call it. Okay, and the, the topic centers around. Oops, I don't want that one. It centers around the, the deep water uh, horizon oil spill. Remember that from the Gulf uh, a few years ago? And so that's the subject matter for this. But they're going to explore finding the area of irregular shapes. Maybe you see where I'm going with this. And here's the uh, platforms on fire. And I give them some content in this. I give them a, there's a model that I made for the oil platform. And I'll pull back a little bit. And there's other things where they can look. And one of the nice things about Google Earth is that you can embed videos from YouTube. And so they can actually you know, stay in Google Earth, and they can watch the video from YouTube and see the, all the oil like pouring out like we did you know, that whole summer. You know, um, oh, or I can give them some links to some other things. I hope these work. Uh, I'll give them links to things. Let me just show you, because I don't think I pointed this out earlier, is that what is another nice thing about Google Earth is that if you link them to, to material, if you use a hyperlink and you put it in there, it's right here in Google Earth. A browser window will, will pop in the main window. And so they can do stuff online. So you've got Google Earth plus the internet. <laughs> think of the possibilities. There's so much you could do. All right, so there's all kinds of content. But uh, what did I say? This is a lesson about... Uh, going to exploring the regular shapes. Oh, that didn't go right. Try that again. So, oops. So this is the the uh, region that was closed off by the federal government for fishing. And if I add the if I add the grid view to this. Then, and then you ask the students, like, well, how much area is this? You can see that's not, not a nice, neat trapezoid or triangle or anything like that. So how would you find the area of this, of this shape? Well, one thing you could do is use the grid. From, from this elevation, uh, each grid is about uh, 1,000 square miles. Each box is 1,000 square miles. So they could do that kind of thing that students do and figure out how many are complete boxes, how many are completely shaded in. They could start combining maybe these two would together make one full. And they could do it like that way. You know, how would you find the area of this shape? Or there's a, a, the Pick's Theorem. You, are you aware of Pick's Theorem? Pick's Theorem, this is the perfect uh, application of a Pick's Theorem can be used to find an area of an irregular shape like this. If you put it on a grid, and then you look on the grid, how many grid intersections lie in the interior and how many lie on the border. So there's two different methods that I give them for finding the area of the shape. And if they want to come up with another one, then fine. Like, you know, I would encourage them to do that. So, um, so this is the federal, the, the area for, that was closed for fishing. And then we go to, this is, um, now this is an overlay that I put in here. This is the oil spill of, uh, at April 25th, which I think was a few days after, after the, uh, the tragedy. 
And then again, they can use the same methods here. Each box here is 10 square miles. They could try to count how many are completely covered. They could use Pick's theorem and try to apply that. How much, how much area is this oil spill covering? Or a few weeks, a few weeks later, uh, this is June 10th, and the oil has spread, right? And you know what kind of uh, environmental disaster it was. Here we have a, you know, a math concept, and I'm put, tying it into environmental, you know, global kind of themes here. What does this have to do? What is the kind of impact does it have on the fishing uh, for, for these states? What, does it have, what kind of impact does it have? So lots of areas for you to explore. Okay. I like that. Oop. What happened there? All right. All right, so uh, let's talk about Explore. I'm gonna, let me show you some exploratory, what I call exploratory activities now. And the first one I'm going to show you is uh, it's called Whale, Whale Watch. And you might guess how I got the idea for this. <laughs> I, was on a, I was on a whale watch in, outside of Boston. And I was wondering how, they, how they, they always knew where the humpback whales were. And so I was looking online to see if there was some data for it. I didn't find anything on humpback whales, but I found a bunch of data on these these uh, North Atlantic right whales. And the reason why it, I found the data for them is that they're endangered. They're endangered whale species. They migrate up along the eastern coast of the United States. And as they travel here through the Cape off of uh, Boston, what happens is these whales, they're slower and they, they stay near the surface more, I guess. They get run over by boats or there's all the fishing gear, the crab trap, lobster traps and all that kind of stuff. They get, tied, they get tangled in that. So they're an endangered whale species, and they're, and they're normally bumming when they're outside of Boston, especially. <laughs> all right, so what I found was all this data on, on the sighting data for, for when these whales have been, have been seen. And I, first, I, I give it to the students in a spreadsheet format. So this lesson kind of addresses like how, how spreadsheets are used to organize data and how they can filter it and arrange it. And then I also provide them with all the data in Google Earth. And if I can zoom into this. And each piece here, let's go to this one. No, I'll go to that one. Each piece here is a piece of data. This is a whale watch. The sighting date was uh, April 24th, 2011. 33 whales in one group. Well, it's a big group. And then it, and then it talks about like uh, how were they spotted? Were they spotted by an airplane or by a whale watching tour or something like that? So all these data pieces have this kind of information. Okay. Now, what's the problem again? Well, they're endangered whales. So do I need to define the problem for them or maybe have them have the students like explore it the way they want to? If you want to address this, I, I, could, I could say like, okay, this is what you have to do, like solve this problem. But you know, I like it when you, when you give it to the, to the students the options to explore it the way they want to. So if we were to, again, you know, you're using math to, to understand things, data, Data, analyzing data, I think, is one of the, the most uh, useful applications of mathematics in today's world. So here they are analyzing data. How would they analyze this data? How would they arrange it in the spreadsheet? In Google Earth, they could change all these place marks. They could change colors if they could change it to, like, um, you know, green. Every place mark that, that's green would mean that that was in April, you know, when the whales were. So then maybe they'd see some patterns of, okay, well, here's where the whales are in April. Here's where the whales are in May. Or, or, or arrange them, they can make them uh, larger icons for the whales that were like a, a group size of 33. So that, okay, here's where the, where the whales like to travel in big groups and things like that. And then once they analyze that data, there's, there's no, there's no uh, one solution to this. You can get all kinds of solutions from the, problem, from the, from the students. But you know, maybe they would look at things like, well, should we change the shipping lanes? Should there be restrictions on fishing? Uh, how, you know, what, how would the students solve this problem? These whales are endangered. Well, how would they address it? Or would they determine that you know, the economy of Boston and shipping is more important? I don't know. It's a real life problem, right? Real world math. Okay. Here's uh, another exploratory activity. <coughs> We're on time. Okay. Um, and I take them to Palau to start off. This is on network. It's uh, network theory. You're familiar with that. And I put them in Palau, and their job is uh, they're a dive boat captain. 
dive boat captain and they've got uh, different groups of snorkelers or divers in the water and the dive boat captain has to go through and pick them all up and he wants to save gas on his, bo on his boat. He doesn't want to run out of gas so he's going to do the most you know, he's going to try to do the most economical uh, path that he can choose. So here, this is the path tool. Let's make sure you can see this. This is the path tool, and I can choose my color. I'm going to make it green. And let me jack this up to six. Okay. And they can start anywhere he wants. So maybe he picks up this group first, and then you know, go up here. And then you know, maybe over here, pick this group up, and that group up. That group of them. Okay, so that's not too hard, right? Well, guess what? As they go further, it gets more and more complicated, and eventually they find out, like, well, sometimes it's just impossible to do everything in a network, in a continuous loop, in a straight line. And perhaps you're more familiar with the more infamous version of this problem, the Konigsberg Bridge problem. So we take them in Google Earth all the way to Konigsberg, Konigsberg. And two of the bridges are gone now, so I had to recreate them myself. But this is how it looked. And if you're unaware of the problem, this is something that, um, uh, I don't know, several hundred years ago, I guess the residents would want to walk around the city, and they try to walk across every bridge only once. They do this after church. This is like their, their activity. Okay? Well, you know, it's a long time ago. They'd have internet. <laughs> All right, so they would try to do this, they would try to do this, and then challenge, and it was uh, Euler who proved that, that it's impossible. Yeah, I'm going across all the different bridges here. There's two more bridges. I can get over this one, but I can't get over that one. And, you know, you can try any kind of uh, arrangement of it. It doesn't work, okay? So Euler is the one who proved, like, look, stop trying. It doesn't work. <laughs> Not only that, but he gave a mathematical basis of why that is. And, and uh, I give them some other, I give them some other variations of it. I try to show them where this might be useful, like maybe like for airplane routes. You know, you might recognize this as a tracing problem. Remember the tracing patterns where you like, don't lift your pencil? Same thing, okay. So I put it in Google Earth. And for this problem, let me make this uh, not red. Okay, for this one, uh, let's see. If uh, if I start here, okay, I'm trying to get through. No, no, no. So so if I start if I start in one spot, it doesn't work. That's what we're gonna find. If I start in a certain location, though, sometimes it will work. So how do you know which is the the right spot to start or which is the right spot to end? That's the kind of thing that Euler figured out. And I'm trying to get the students, I guess, to recreate what Euler did, just to figure out why that is. It's so annoying. If I start here, let's see, and go up here, and go here. I'm trying to trace this. I'm trying to, I can go through points more than once, but I don't want to travel in segments any more than one. Hey, I think I'm going to do it. All right, so I had to start it there, and I had to, you know, maybe I had to stop there. But, you know, there's certain ways that it can be solved, and, and other ways that it's not going to work. And I want students to explore that. And I don't tell them, look, hey, here's the deal. This is why this works, or figure this out. It's not until the end where I put them back on uh, Palau on a nice beach. At the very end of the activity, they're in a beach of Palau, and, and the question now is, like, how? Huh, what's going on with all that? I mean, what did you find out? Why did it work sometimes, and why didn't it work other times? What's, what kind of, try to get the student to, to put the math in their own, in their own words. Right? Try, try to explain it. Try to give like, tips to people for solving it. You know, how would they advise people, other students, to how to solve these problems? So, you know, network theory in itself may not be the most useful thing for the students at, you know, let's say they're doing this at middle school age or elementary age, something like that. But, uh, you know, exploring the math kind of topic like that and making sense of it for themselves, I think that's, that's useful. All right. So these are my, my, I think, my favorite activities now, the, the project-based learning activities that I have on my website. Uh, project-based learning, I, the way I use that, is, that, that terminology, I guess, is, is it's, it's something that's going to take longer. It might take a month. It might take a whole quarter or something like that. There's normally stages to it. It's more advanced. The students might be working with other in groups. They might have changing roles during and stuff. So this one's called the uh, U-boat hunt. And, and it starts off with, um, 
It starts off with some great material available from NOVA and PBS, and it covers uh, how mathematicians helped the war effort in, during World War II. And the mathematicians in, uh, in Britain uh, you know, decoded the Nazi, the Nazi Enigma code. And so it's kind of a, a thrilling math story, about the th most thrilling math story you could probably get. And so they look at the history of that, and the students learn how to write ciphers and how to, how to uh, decode ciphers, how to decipher information, how to cipher information. They do that with this other sort of material. And then I send them on a mission, and, and they, get, they start getting these communications here from, uh, from this guy. And they start looking for U-boats. Let me close that, sorry. They're going to start looking for U-boats, Nazi U-boats, submarines. And each place mark has a clue in it. And the clue is going to tell them the latitude and the longitude of where another submarine is located. So this is the first one. This is the U-boat pens in, uh, in France. And it says this is the location of the U-boat pens. And uh, here's a code that you have to, you have to decode this. Uh, the first numbers will show you the latitude, and the second set of numbers will tell you the longitude. So here's the code, and then, and then it's a number pattern. So the first one is 35, 37, 39, 41, right? And the next one is negative 21, negative 19, negative 17, negative 15. Again, I always start off easy, 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 and then it gets progressively harder as you go through it. So. They're going to turn in the answer that the, uh, they think there's a U-boat, and it's at uh, 41 degrees uh, latitude and negative 15 degrees longitude. And then they submit that, and if they are correct, then they are awarded with a new place mark. They found out that they did find a U-boat. It was at this location. It, they're always sunk. It's always sunk. <laughs> and, uh, and then they get their next clue the next number pattern to look for the next U-boat, and they go through that. Now, just to show you how, how um, obsessive compulsive I am with this sort of thing, this is an actual U-boat and from history. These are all like, actually historical events. It's the actual day that it was stunk, uh, sunk, and it's the actual latitude, longitude coordinates of where this U-boat was sunk. So as historically, everything is like pristine, uh, accurate. And then I give them links to other things here. Remember, we can go to the internet. So if they want to learn more about it, they can go to uh, uboat.net, and they can learn more from, uh, from history about this certain U-boat. Doesn't sound like fun? You know, when are we ever going to use this? Uh, you're going to hunt Nazi submarines. <laughs> I'm in. OK, so the whole folder, you know, once they go through it all, they get a whole bunch of different place marks. They'll find out that. Uh, that there are U-boats sunk over you know, south of Florida, uh, down in Central America, even down here in, in South America, they're going to find U-boats. And they're chasing U-boats. And they're trying to capture, their ultimate goal is to capture a U-boat so they can get a copy of the Enigma decoding machine. right? Because every, every submarine's got the coding machine. So they're trying to capture it. It's not until they get to the last place mark where they get to U-boat 505. <laughs> and they get, finally get the captured. Uh, you know, thing, and a congratulations. And then you can see from the, the photo that this is an actual, again, a historical event. Uh, this U-boat was actually captured, and they actually got the decoding machine, you know, from, from the submarine and stuff. And, and then also that this is the submarine that you can see at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. So especially if they're in Chicago, that would be, that would be great to do like a field trip after that. Right? So I like that. That's a, you know, it doesn't take a lot of time in class. They, they're going to just do these, these little number pattern things. So it could just take a few minutes, really. But because you have to like you know, distribute these place marks like day after day, that it could stretch out to be you know, several weeks long. All right, another project-based learning activity. Oh, I like this one. This is um, search and rescue project. This one's closer to home for me. We go all the way back to the Isle of Guam where we started. And there seems to be a certain handsome, dashing math teacher who has been reported missing. <laughs> he was paddling off the, off the point here, and he never returned home. And he's been reported as uh, you know, lost at sea. And so the students are put into different Coast Guard teams. And they get a helicopter and a, and a cutter. And uh, by daylight, they have to go and start doing their search and rescue plan. Okay, 
Now, I give them some information. They, they learn about uh, actual search and rescue patterns, search patterns that, that are used, and they're going to have to determine which is the best search pattern to use for this scenario. I also give them uh, like a primary and a secondary area to search in. And then we start talking about variables. What kind of, you know, if they want to ask any kind of question, you know, what do they want to know about? What kind of information do they need to know? So they start thinking about, well, we want to know which way is the current going? How high are the waves? How far can, how far can you see a, a boat or a human if you're in a helicopter flying? You know, how far can, can they see forever? Or, you know, it probably has to be kind of short, right? Or how fast is the boat, the rescue boat, how fast does it go? As fast as it can go, or they go kind of slow? They, have, they only have one day because there's a, a typhoon that's approaching. So they only have one day to like to find their math teacher. So you know they're trying really hard. <laughs> okay. And so here's a student example of the work that they did this uh, rescue pattern. And they mapped out. They mapped out for the helicopter and for the Coast Guard cutter. And they've plotted it out and they showed the times of where they did the different turns. And it all has to match up because uh, it has to go so fast you know, to be able to see somebody, and they only, they only have so many hours of daylight. And then, so they submit that to me, and then once that's submitted, then I give them this, and that's the drift path of the missing math teacher. So this is, I'm telling you, like, this is where I am. And then they can go back and compare and see if they actually rescued me or not. I'd like to know. And this looks pretty good. It looks like I crossed their path like many times, but this is why they had to find the times, because when you look at this, oh, this is like 8 o'clock in the morning. I was up here, and their helicopter wasn't there until like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So, alas, I was lost at sea. Well, the whole time I was up here, they were down too far south searching for me. So maybe they should ask or, or listen to the you know, variables a little bit different. But, you know, that's a nice activity. We went to different layers of it. They're working in groups. We used uh, Google Docs where they were, uh, you know, collaborating, answering questions and things that I had for them. So I like that one. And uh, the nice thing about that one is afterwards we went to uh, a math field trip. Oh, what? Yeah, a math field trip. Imagine. We went to the Coast Guard station on Guam, uh, took a field trip there, and... And the, the guys there were like so impressed with my students and how knowledgeable they were about search and rescue. They started like telling them, it was like, yeah, yeah, we know, that's the focal point. And then they started like finishing their sentences. They were so impressed that, that all of a sudden like we, we, we went to like the different tour, we got on the VIP tour at the Coast Guard station. So we, all, we saw all kinds of like neat stuff. And the best part for me was, was that they, showed, they shared with me that there's actually an equation that they use for the, for the computers and stuff when they do the rescue things. There's an actual equation that the, that the Coast Guard uses when, they're, when they do these search and rescue things, and it's got variables like we were talking about, and they, you know, they enter the values for the variables and use that for, to determine their search pattern. So again, like wow, like a really uh, real world uh, application of math. So um, I like that one. If you, if you don't have a Coast Guard station uh, near where you live. I mean, there's other search and rescue things. You can, you can kind of adapt this to be like a search and rescue for a field or, or something like that. Okay? All right. So, how am I doing on time? Okay, about 10 minutes. That's pretty good. All right, so let me uh, start wrapping this up, and maybe we'll have some time for some, some questions here. Uh, I would be... Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention my good friend Jerome Berg, who has a kind of a similar website he started before me called Google Lit Trips, and Google Lit Trips is uh, uh, adventures in literature in Google Earth, and he provides uh, background background information for different novels like Grapes of Wrath or, or uh, Odyssey and things like that. So it's a kind of a companion when students are doing their, their reading to give them some information. So Jerome Berg is always gives a shout out for me. So. So that's a very good, uh, very good resource. You can, if you go on YouTube, you'll find some discussions between uh, Jerome and I, uh, you know, presentations that we've done before. Uh, they'll be on YouTube. But uh, there's that. And then also let me make sure that I get this up to you. I'm uh, more than uh, eager to, to uh, communicate with anyone. If you want to, you can uh, email me or follow me on Twitter. Uh, definitely check out the website, realworldmath.org or Google+. And any, anything that um, when people want help, like I, like I pursue, I, I help them out. You know, whatever. I, don't, I won't leave you uh, hanging and stuff. 
Okay. Do we have any questions or things that you'd like me to address? I can anticipate a couple of them, I think. Yes. Do you ever have your students create their own problems in the Google room? Well, some of the, you know, like, for instance, uh, the last one that I showed you with the search and rescue, that they'll create the, the search patterns. They'll, they'll be editing the material. They'll put folder, they'll create folders and paths and place marks. But normally it's something that I start them off with and tell them, like, you know, I want you to create this, and, and then you have to share it with me. That's one of the nice things about Google Earth, right? The technology that you can share the digital form. They can do it at home even, and they can email it to me, and I can, I can open it up you know, where I am. So um, you know, that's a really nice thing is that it's very versatile in how you incorporate it, whether you want to do it as like a distance learning project or a food classroom or something in the classroom or a computer lab or anything. But yeah, definitely. Um, it there's a little bit of a learning curve of how to use Google Earth for students. You'll find some tutorials. Uh, on my website, or all, you know, there's all kinds of tutorials on the web too if you go looking for it for Google Earth. Um, but you know, I've I have second graders, I don't know, second graders using Google Earth or first graders. You know, you know how kids are, right? They catch on quick for these. They, I guess it depends on what you want them to do with it. Uh, yes. How do I actually create it? No, I, I know. Uh, well, like I said, like the whale watch one, I, I'm on a whale watching tour. And I, you know, I started thinking, like, well, why is it? You know, it normally starts with me kind of like wondering. And then that's kind of like where it starts. So then I start researching. So I go on the internet and I start looking and I start learning. And that's really great about this, about doing this sort of thing, developing, because it's not just like the students that are learning, but like I, I learn and I grow from it. So I learned a lot. I've become like expert level. The Indian Ocean tsunami, I, I'm like, well, maybe not anymore, but a few years ago when I was doing that one, I was like expert level of the Indian Ocean tsunami. I could give you all kinds of information on it. But I started learning about whales and things like that, and, and then I started trying to think of how to, how to approach it. No, no. Uh, and then you'll see, you'll, you'll find tutorials on, on my website. You know, you'll see some of my stuff looks kind of good because I, I use um, HTML. Uh, I, I do some coding to make the place marks look better, you know, maybe than you would get normally in Google Earth. But I tell you how to do it. I show you how to do that too. Um, but no, you want to like put a nice package together. You want to make sure that it all fits in folders and things and you know sequence. And you want to give them instructions if you know where it's needed for what to do. Anybody else? All right. Before uh, too many people take off, let me put this up. Because they want feedback. Oh, there it is. Feedback. So there's, uh, I'm supposed to tell you, there's three ways to provide feedback on this session, the mobile app, the mobile website, the conference website. You can uh, give me a raving review or uh, Rotten Tomatoes or whatever you like. Okay, but I hope that you learned, uh, you know, I hope you learned something today that you can find useful for you in the future. And, uh, you know, Really, the possibilities with Google Earth, and then, like I said, when you can incorporate like the internet with it too, then there's, there's all kinds of different things that you can do. Any different uh, grade level, subject area, anywhere you want to look at it. Okay. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Oh, you know that's one of the first things when I when I uh, when I created the website is I wanted people to share it with me. And then, you know, I'd give you credit. My, my website's free, by the way. Did I say that, right? It's free. I don't get any money. Boy, I don't get any money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get any money for it, anything like that. And I give you credit. I'll say, you know, so-and-so submitted this one. Jerome Berg is excellent at that. At Google Lit Trips, he's got all kinds of things that teachers and students have submitted that he posts on the website, different tours for different novels that they're reading. And I've always been asking, begging people to, like, submit stuff for, for my website. So, yeah, please do. Okay. All right, well, uh, thank you for attending. Thank you. My honor, my honor to talk to you. Thank you very much.